Okay, so we're back here at the spoke shave project. So this is a hot rod project the same way that, uh, that this uh, improved gouge, seriously improved gouge, um, was a hot rod project. And even though we call this gouge, um, it's really a knife in that it is a single edge tool that's controlled by you. Uh, and pushed uh, in order to cut. You can think of these spoke shaves and, and planes, hand planes, as knives that are, that are fit to a specific holder that's designed to help us take small controlled cuts. Okay, so that's really the project. So what we're gonna do is to try and raise the performance of a regular spoke shave to its maximum potential in order to perform accurate, smooth cuts on our plates. And here's a curly maple plate. This is a good example of a very difficult material to work with. A grain is going back and forth every which way and is an extremely demanding material. The, it's my contention that it's so much more fun to cut it than it is to whack at it with sandpaper or power tools that this is really a worthwhile project. Before we get into this, and this is the deep end of the pool in my estimation, why don't we uh, just follow up from where we left off on the last film we were talking about sandblasting and I was kind of sheepishly saying, well, am I gonna show you, am I gonna use my sandblaster or not? And what happened was after we were finished filing this surface, we still had little dots of red paint here and there. And since we're gonna solder a, a new piece of material to this surface, we don't want red paint in that joint. So the sandblaster was an easy way to, um, to get this surface clean and paint free. All right, this is the surface that we're talking about. I was feeling guilty about specifying a sandblaster, but then I looked up online and you can get a perfectly serviceable sandblaster ready to go for $15, so there's no excuse. It's a fantastic technique for all kinds of things. It promotes adhesion. If you're trying to glue something, and certainly great for soldering. And it's also just a cool surface. Sometimes you want to sandblast the surface and just leave it be because it looks cool. It tends to hide a myriad of sins as well, so it's attractive for that reason. It kind of blends the surface visually with a nice even patina from the sand impacts. I remembered that somehow that the sandblasted surface was able to increase the surface area by a factor of five. That's something I remember reading a long time ago. And when I looked it up just now to check, the, and here's the link to uh, what I looked up, it says as much as 10 times. So imagine that just by making the little hills and valleys that the sand makes when it cuts into the surface and abrades the surface, it can um, really, really increase the surface area. So that's great for, as we were saying just now, for gluing with um, some bonding agent or soldering, which is also another kind of bonding agent. So that's, um, that's the sandblasting story. Good thing to have. Uh, we don't use it very often, but it really is a useful tool, okay? so. The reason we're doing this is we're going to change the throat opening to the optimum size. And let me just show you an example of a tool. This is a, a nice tool that the Stanley Company made. I can't remember when they was, these were first made, but it's an, it's an old tool. It's number 100 and a half. And some people call this a squirrel tail plane for obvious reasons. Um, fits the hand pretty well. And when I was first uh, building arch tops, I used this 
tool quite a lot. The uh, arc on the bottom of the plane, in, uh, fore and aft, is a, a 12 inch radius arc. And across this way is 875 or 7 eighths of an inch. And so it's about right, this 12 inch radius arc is about right for what we want to do. But this is pretty big curve, probably more than we would really want it to be. Here's a couple of other examples of planes that you can just buy. Here's an Ibex brand plane, which is a pretty nice tool, high quality tool. And here's a Chinese copy of it that's um, not quite as nicely made, but could be made to work pretty well. Now, you'll see in both of these tools, in all of these tools, I mean all of these three tools, that there's a, a substantial throat opening. So this is our throat opening, this distance, the distance between the blade and the last part of the infeed sole that's controlling the, the material before it gets cut. So the larger that throat opening, the less support the wood has and the easier it is for the uh, plain blade to lift and break the material. And that's, you know, of course, it's a disaster for the surface. So what we would really prefer to have is a throat opening more like this. So here's a, here's a block plane, my favorite little block plane, with an iron in it. And let's see, you know, this is set for probably four four thousandths cut or something like that. And then, of course, on this plane, you can, you can change the throat opening by pushing the front of the sole, the infeed table, back and forth until you get it where you want. Well, that's great because it's flat. So this is a two-dimensional surface, and there's any number of ways to control the throat opening with a flat plane. On a, a bench plane, of course, there's a a frog and you can move the frog back and forth and if you go on YouTube there's any number of smart people that are going to describe to you how you can get your flat plane to do beautiful work, take gorgeous shavings, partly due to the ability of these tools to adjust the throat opening to be as close as it can be. And so when we think about as close as it can be, what we want is the throat opening to be just big enough to clear the biggest chip that you would want to take, plus about two thousandths of an inch clearance, or 0.05-ish millimeters. So that means if you're going to take a three thousandths cut, which is a pretty big cut, you would want this opening to be about five thousandths. If you wanted to take a five thousandths cut, which is pretty aggressive cut, you know, for doing a, a surface like this, it's a pretty aggressive cut, you'd want a seven thousandths throat opening. The problem though, is that the tools that we're talking about modifying and using on the insides of the plates particularly are, are necessarily convex. There are spoon bottom planes, of course, this isn't a plane, a spoke shape, but it's really the same idea, the same device. Only problem is it's three-dimensional surface instead of two-dimensional surface. And if you think, well, that's just one more dimension, then let me suggest that the difference is something like walking down the sidewalk and flying an airplane. It's just one more dimension. So uh, we get quite a lot of complexity and challenge for adding this third dimension to the surface that we intend to be able to use. What I've done in the past is I've soldered in a piece of brass or bronze. You could use stainless steel or steel, cast iron, anything you want. I'm using brass because it's easy to work with and I have it. And then in the milling machine, as I showed you a little bit 
on the last one, we've got a fixture that holds it in the milling machine and blah, blah, blah. But I wanted to design a way for people to do this that was simple and did not require a lot of big, heavy equipment. I'm very happy that I've been able to come up with this new way of doing it, which is it's one of the benefits that I'm getting from Arch Topri because I never would have bothered trying to figure out how to do it without a milling machine because I have one. So anyway, here is what we're doing on this project now. Here's the infeed bed. All right, over here. And the brass insert, this piece of material we're adding that we're going to solder to this surface that we've just filed and sandblasted. And then here's the blade that we're going to use, which is one of these beautiful uh, Veritas blades that's thicker. So it's 2.36 millimeter, 332-093 thickness blade. And then here's the output bed where it sits and clamps and can be adjusted for depth of cut. So what we end up with is a surface here on the brass insert that is absolutely parallel with this blade, the top of the blade surface. What that's going to do is it's going to allow us to curve this flat bottom tool across its width like this to make this curved surface and we'll still be able to maintain exactly the throat opening that we want all the way from one side to the other. Okay? And uh, in this drawing, this is an assembly drawing. In order to get this tool to cut, I would have to remove this shim. And you see here that I've put in this, um, this 5,000th shim, which is, um, what is it here, 1.2 something millimeters shim, in between the bed and the blade. And that way, this insert will come out perfectly parallel to the top surface of the blade. And when we remove that shim, there'll be a 5,000th gap in between these two surfaces, and it'll be a parallel gap, the, 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 si the kind of gap that we want. And that way, because these surfaces are parallel and there's some length to this surface, we'll be able to curve the plane across its width and still have a nice surface to determine our throat opening, okay? So the job now that we're going to do is we're going to create this little piece of brass and fit it very carefully to this angle so that when we clamp it in place, it's smack down on top of the blade here, the top surface of the blade. And as it turns out, the tool, the spokeshave itself, because we have these two threaded fasteners here, it's two threaded rods, those things are going to help us by becoming a part of a new tool that we'll just use once to clamp this in. And so here's our clamp. And this is a, another blade. We're going to use the blade that came with this spoke shave, which we sharpened. And that blade is going to come in here on top of the real blade, and it's going to contact the brass insert, and it's going to force it in this direction. So it's going to slam it up against this bottom part of the infeed bed and also against the top surface of the plane blade. So it will automatically ensure a perfect parallel gap when we're all done. And that's, that's the name of the game. And I'm, <laughs> I'm delighted that this has worked out this way. And I'm going to show you how this works. It's really pretty easy, and we won't need much more than um, 
a file and a hacksaw to get this done. It's going to be great. All right, so I thought I would do a little bit of a dry run here because I want to make sure that this all makes sense before we go into the uh, machine shop and make this part. So again, let's, let's show how this whole thing works, how, this, how we clamp the brass insert in place and get ready to solder the brass insert to the infeed bed, okay? So here's our, our spoke-shaped body, and here's the 5 thousandths shim material that we're going to use to space the blade, all right? Now we're going to put the blade in backwards, and I think you'll see why in a minute. So this blade now is just being used as a spacer. Obviously, we're not doing any work with it. Um, now, we have this part that I already made uh, to prove this all out, okay? And so this is a kind of a parallelogram-shaped piece of brass that we were going to cut out of this piece. So we're going to make another one, but here I'll just show you how this goes together. So this little guy goes in here. That's where it'll be when it's all done. Then here's the clamping part of the blade, the clamp extra blade for a clamp. So this is the bevel down, so it touches the brass insert a little bit above the real blade and is able to exert some nice force on that. Okay, so here's, a, here's the screw that comes with this tool. And we'll just um, lightly hold these things together. Okay, and then turns out All we're going to need to clamp it is, these are so-called fender washers. They're, they're thick. You get these at the hardware store, oversized. I'm not exactly sure why they're called fender washers. And because the tops of these adjusters have a dome top, just so happens that when we turn these over, it turns out to be a really, really good way to clamp and push the blade in. So now we're going to clamp it in nice and tight. Make sure this is tight. Okay. And now let's see if we can get a good view over here of what we've got. Here's a little piece of our brass insert sticking out. And I think if we look closely, we can see that it's sticking out a little farther on this side than it is on this side. And that's because we just referred to the cast surfaces on the plane body, a spoke-shaved body, which actually are pretty good, but you can see that it's It's, a little, it's sticking out a little bit farther here than here. And that won't matter, because all we care about is parallelism. Um, and then, of course, here's the 5,000th shim, which is making sure that this blade is not touching the bed surface. And, of course, when, when we're all done, we'll take that shim out, and we'll get the same clearance as we have for shim material. So we're using five thousandths. You could use a different size if you wanted. If you wanted the, the throat opening smaller for really tiny cuts, you could use maybe four thousandths. Or if you wanted to use it for making heavier cuts, you could use a larger shim, maybe seven thousandths or eight thousandths. And we'll talk about that more when we're all done. We'll talk about some possibilities that this design gives you for adjusting the throat opening when, when it's all done. So here we go. This is it. This is our um, dirt, simple, off-the-shelf hardware stuff. Just a couple of washers is all you need. A, a little stick of brass. I'm going to make a mark on here for now. And 
And uh, if we want, we could reduce the height of this just for appearance's sake, because this won't, this extra material won't help us. That's about it. That's what we're doing. This is what we're going to aim at. And now I'm going to show you what I've learned about making this part so that it fits in here perfectly flat and parallel to the blade surface.